Well, uh, we're in this uh, series called Like a Child and looking at some things, some questions that kids ask that are really kind of adult questions. And today, uh, we come to a little note that was written by Joyce to God. And she says, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. Well, um, I know how you feel, Joyce. Uh, I know how your brother feels. Um, my parents um, told me that the reason that they decided to have me was so my sister would have someone to play with. Uh, that, that's probably the, uh, <laughs> the reason for some of us second kids. I don't know, but don't tell your kids that, all right? That's the wrong thing to tell them, that we had you so your older brother or sister would have someone to play with. But uh, we, we know, uh, I want to tell Joyce, that you, you can't always get what you want, right? But in the words of the famous philosopher Mick Jagger, but if you try sometimes, you just might find that you get what you need. And that's God's will. The subject we're tackling today is uh, way too large for one Sunday, uh, the will of God. And uh, what is the will of God? Um, it's huge. So understand, I'm just going to take off a little slice today. Uh, I, I won't run over, I don't think. And the subject's very popular. Uh, similar forms of this question, uh, for the reality is that I, I don't think a lot of people really want to know what God's will is. We say that we do, but we, we really don't want to know what God's will is. I, I, to know God's will is this huge thing, and with it comes all these responsibilities and, and possible failures. You know, if we really knew what God wanted us to do all the time, then, you know, specifically, then it's like, who's going to live that? So, but when we say, uh, how do I know the will of God for my life, uh, uh, people mean different things. And it's, you know, usually it's stuff like, should I move to uh, Portland or Chicago? Or should I take my money out of investments and shift it someplace else? Or should I refinance my home right now? Or should I wait? Or should I go back to college? And should I change jobs? And should I move in with him or her? Or should I get a dog? Is this the right time to get a dog? You know, all these questions that we have to, we want to know what God's will is. And, and that's the way we frame it long list of decisions and some are rather important and most of them probably aren't that important but the common question um, is about God's will for my life as that will impacts the decisions that I must make and you know I think it's assumed that God has this plan for our lives a, a perfect specific plan that includes things like whether I should move to Chicago or whether Portland, and we think that there's this plan out there, and um, you know, there's a lot of confusion uh, about this, and I just want to cover a few things here. Um, this is not a conclusive thing about uh, the different ways that we try to find God's will, but uh, the first one I think of is what I would call Bible lottery, and Bible lottery is when, you know, you don't go to the Word much, but, but then you've got this decision coming up, so you say, well, I'm going to go ask God, and you just open up the Bible and put your finger down someplace and read the verse and say, oh, well, okay, I don't know, you know, I don't know what that means. You know, people actually, maybe you've done, I've never done it, but people, maybe you've done that. There's another form of Bible lottery is that like you've got this decision coming up, and so then you go to church and you listen intently for everything that the minister says, for some kind of clue in there about you know, God might be giving you this decoded message through, this, this, through the pastor's sermon. And sometimes it makes me really uncomfortable, not with you guys, but I've had it, you know, with other people where, like, you, I used to stand at the door at the back of the church to be told how wonderful I was every Sunday. And everybody would come out and shake your hand, go, you're just fantastic, you're wonderful. Most of them would say that. And every once in a while somebody would say something like, Man, I got the word from you today. I say, really? And they say, yeah, I had a question coming in, but uh, I think I got my answer today. And you always go, oh, wow, what did they hear? You know? And, and most of the time they've got some kind of, you know, expectation that God's going to say something to them kind of in secret that nobody else hears, and then that's going to be the answer to their problem. And that's what I would call Bible lottery. The, the Bible is not a magic book. Uh, it doesn't need decoding in any way. The second kind of confusion I think of is, is what's called the eight ball method 
Uh, some of you probably remember Yoder ones that used to have this, this magic eight ball that you could buy when I was a kid. Uh, my friend Kent got one of them because his, my parents wouldn't let me have one, but Kent got one. And you, it was like this, this big eight ball and you turn it over and there's this little bitty window. Have you seen these things? Little bitty window and it's filled with liquid and these tiles would pop up and go yes or no or ask me tomorrow and those kind of things and like you know you could ask all kinds of different things and just do it and it had an answer it was like having God in your hand you know and and you just ask him anything and he always answers and you just keep asking until you get the the answer asking until you get the answer that you want is great and they ask uh, for signs from God and you know God if you want me to take the job then you know you know uh, if you want me to take the job, Lord, here's another way of doing it. Uh, then let the cats win. Okay, well, the cats didn't win, so how about two out of three, Lord? If the cats win two out of three, then I should take the job. But, but it's always just kind of, you know, asking these outside sources. A cousin to the eight ball is, of course, um, the Ouija board, which is a little bit more advanced, kind of spooky kind of thing. And uh, the horoscope, you know which is just, I just read it just for fun. And, and then, you know, when you get hardcore, you go into the psychic. You know, you lay out some money and they tell you things that nobody else can know. And it's all about the plan of God. I need to know what to do. And the psychic is going to tell me things about God that are secret, you know. And these things actually even make less sense because uh, we go there looking for God, and what we're given is exact opposite. I mean, it sounds kind of right, may sound good, uh, but we might even get encouraged by it. But the source is is really one of deceit, and eventually we'll find out that we've been lied to, and the information that we acted on was false information. Now, the third area that I think uh, that we go to the most often is that of feelings. And I don't think any of us can, can say that we haven't been here. All kinds of weird things that people do trying to discover God's will. I think the most prevalent is our emotions and our feelings. We're, we're emotional creatures. Uh, I tell us over and over that 80% of the decisions that we make are emotional decisions. That's, that's a biological fact, you know. And we think that since we are doing what we want to do and that we're being quote, true to ourselves, that it must be God's will because I'm doing what is true to me. I'm just being myself, following our heart. We, we hear that all the time. And that often doesn't work out exactly the way that we think it should. Um, we think, well, isn't it someplace in the Bible where it says to uh, follow your heart? No, it's not in there uh, that I found it. What it says is love me with all your heart, you know, which is an action. It's not about emotions at all. And I, I don't want you to misunderstand our, our emotions. I mean, we're given our emotions by God, our feelings by God. Uh, God doesn't expect us to be kind of these stoic robots that just are always so logical and have no feelings or emotions, but quite the opposite. But haven't we all made a bad decision when we were on a bummer for a while? I mean, hasn't everybody made an emotional decision that you wish that you could undo sometimes because you were having a bad day or somebody did something to you? And, and then you make this decision. And, you know, when we trust our emotions, we get into trouble. Paul, uh, in his teaching to the Galatians, spoke of what he called desire and the flesh. And, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, he said that the flesh, our, our fallen physical desire, he says, our flesh is at odds with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.16, he says, I say, be guided by the Spirit and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit, and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They're opposed to each other, so you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. Boy, that last line. You shouldn't do whatever you want to do. How contrary that is to, you know, the culture in which we live, where we're told, do what you want to do because that's who God made you. And Paul says, no, that's opposed to the Spirit. You can't be in the Spirit and be following the Holy Spirit and be following your flesh at the same time. 
and the spirit and the flesh are opposite of each other. So if we follow the desires, the feelings, the flesh will not get where we really want to go. So, uh, on the uh, confusion here, uh, the Bible is not a gimmick book. It's not Bible lottery. Uh, we don't need to go outside to find things out about God. And it's not about feelings. But here comes the positive thing. Um, God wants us to know what his will is. He wants us to know, you know, God's will, excuse me, uh, he wants us to tell us his will, but God's will is not the same thing as God's plan. I think we, we get those things kind of confused. And, and I know if I were to preach today and said, well, I'm going to give you four things on how you can learn what God's plan is for your life. Everybody be taking notes and be leaning in. Because that's really what we want to do. We want to know what this specific plan is. The reality is, and somebody please correct me after the, after the sermon if, 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 if you find this out, but I can't find any place in the Bible where God specifically tells a person what the plan for every decision in life is going to be. It's just not there. God reveals his will, but as far as it be some kind of specific plan about you're to do this and then do this and then do this for life, I just don't see it's there. Uh, the Bible doesn't promise that. In fact, I think it seems kind of insignificant. The Bible speaks of men and women being called, and you know we're each called to something. I, I believe that. We're each called to something. I'm called to be a pastor. Some of you are called to be parents. Some of you are called to be teachers. Some of you are called to, to be in health care and to be servants. And, and some of you are called to be in the marketplace and to be a witness for God in the marketplace. I think everybody has a calling upon your life. But let's not confuse that with a plan. Uh, each of us, there's never any reference to any kind of a, a blueprint that includes things like, oh, go to this college and then move to this city and then buy that house and blah, 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 blah. It, it's just not there. Instead, the will of God for us is not a plan, but rather it's a desire. And if I were to choose one synonym for the word will as it's used in reference to God in Scripture, it would be desire. This is God's desire. God has a desire for our lives. God has a desire of who we are to become. And, and it's in his perfect, as we would say, intentional will. And it's, not, it's really not difficult to determine, guys. And here's the promise in advance. If, if we live into that desire, if we listen to God, if we know him and live into that desire, then all of the plans that we worry about, all the decisions, they take care of themselves. For we will know what to do. And if we don't know what to do, it just doesn't make any difference. It's just insignificant on those things. I told some of you my sad story about a week ago Friday. Um, I got some sympathy from a few of you. Last Friday, I set out to do just a really simple thing, which is to clean the church's trailer out so we could fill it up with junk and take it over to our uh, thing over at the park, over, over at the, the, oh, come on, over at the apartments on Sunday night. And the day just, what, what should have been about a three-hour job took the whole day, and at the end of the day, I was just done. And it was all because of a tire that was on the trailer that wouldn't pump up with air, and then I couldn't get the lug nuts off, and it turned into kind of this really humiliating fiasco of me being out in the middle of the parking lot out here, being so worn out, I had to go sit by the tree over and over and rest the old man because I couldn't get the lug nuts off the trailer. And as I was sitting over by the tree, I was, you know, lapsing back into my default and going, oh, God, uh, do you really want me to do this? Or maybe, Lord, you're trying to stop me from doing this. Maybe I should just leave the trailer here with a flat tire on and go home and say God doesn't want me to do it. Or maybe it's Satan that's trying to keep me from changing the tire and do something for the Lord. And I was back and forth. And, and, and by the time that, you know, I got the thing done, I realized... It really doesn't make any difference. It really isn't that important. You know, what's important is that I'm serving him. I'm looking to him. And whether I get the tire fixed today or tomorrow, and the whole scheme of the kingdom of God doesn't make a whole lot of difference, you see. But it's easy to get off track. 
Now, here's the good news. God has promised us that we will know his will. We're told in a consistent message that if we want to know God's desire, that he will tell us what that is. If we seek him, we will find him. We will know the will of God, and we will know the will of God because we know the Lord. See, God doesn't hide himself. God isn't, you know, like, you know, I'm going to give you some coded thing and see if you can figure it out. And, and you know, then, aha, uh-huh, I, I know what the will of God is. But, but he comes to us quite clearly, quite simply. Now, in the, the Old Testament, in the first covenant, you know, God does things with signs. And we need to make this distinction here. In the Old Testament, it's, it's just by signs that God reveals his will to people. And if you think back, you know, there's like the story of Moses being called. And, and God says, okay, Moses says, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this. You know, I'm not sure you're really who you say you are. How do I know? And God says, well, stick your hand in your coat. And I pull it out. It's got leprosy on it. Stick it back in. Oh, doesn't have leprosy when I pull it back out. It's a sign. God's saying, I am who I am. Right? And we look back on that, we go, wow, trickster, you know, doing all this stuff. But that's the way that he deals with people in the Old Testament. You know, he gives them these very clear signs. When he says, I led you by my hand, he means he literally led them by his hand. Then they're going through the wilderness, the pillar of fire at night, the, the pillar of cloud during the day. When it moved, they moved. They didn't need to get together and say, well, let's have a prayer meeting and try to discern what God wants us to do. They knew because God was giving them a clear sign. And throughout the Old Testament, at almost every juncture, there are these very clear signs that God leads them clearly. When we get to the New Testament, though, it changes. In the New Testament, signs are given, but all of the signs just point to Jesus. And he is the revelation. It's all about him. So we get to the book of John, and there are like eight major signs as we go through the book of John. And each one confirms that Jesus is the Messiah. And God is saying, well, you want to know what God looks like? Here he is in Jesus Christ. He reveals who I am. No one has seen God at any time, John says. But his only son has explained him to us. And so the signs cease, and God has a much more intimate way of revealing his will to us, and that is through Jesus Christ. In essence, he's saying, here's your last sign. If you want to know me, know him. Once once you know him, you will know everything there is to know about my will. God's not hiding. God's not some secret God who only gives knowledge to those who have the code. God says, here I am. If you want to know my will, my desire for you, then know my son. And that's why I say that we can be 100% sure of God's will because Jesus reveals his will to us. Uh, scriptures like this. I'm going to use a few here, uh, a few more than what I normally do. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Most of us know this passage. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's promise that we will know his will if we are in Christ Jesus. We don't need signs. We don't need some special revelation. It says that if we know Jesus, we will know his will. We have been given all these signs to point to him. He's the revealer to us. All we need to know is by living in him. And, and I remind us once again when it says in Christ, that preposition in could just as easily be translated as into. Um, our, our Greek man stepped out of the room on time, but, uh, but, but we could. And I, I love that translation when it says living into Christ. Because it shows, you know, determination, it shows future, it, sh- it shows movement. And, and when we live into Christ, we know God's will. And God wants us to know him. This isn't difficult. And look at that, that verse here on how praying is connected. It says, pray continually. Okay? It says, pray continually. How do you know God's will? You ask him what his will is. You pray continually. You know that God probably is not going to give you some kind of a sign, but but in your humble asking, God reveals to you his will. And if you're living into Christ, okay, you begin to know the will of God. 
Now, here's another one. Look at this wonderful passage, James 1, 5. Most of us have heard this. It says, but anyone who needs wisdom should ask God, whose very nature is to give to everyone without a second thought, without keeping score. Wisdom will certainly be given to those who ask. Such certainty there. There's no if or so that's. It's, it's just all very clear and a clear promise. If we don't know what to do, we're to ask. God will reveal that to us. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to hear voices. It doesn't mean that there's going to be some special revelation to us. It, it usually is quite the opposite. It usually means that God will, in time, as we pray, uh, tell us things about himself. Sometimes we are not even aware of it. Some of you have probably seen the movie Shadowland. C.S. Lewis remains one of my favorite authors. C.S. Lewis was a, an Englishman who was a professor at Oxford and uh, was converted later in life and was a single man. And then uh, he had, uh, this, the movie Shadowlands tells a story of how he had this marriage of convenience with uh, Joy uh, Gresham, uh, who was an American, and he married her so she could stay there in, in England is the reason why he married her. But after he married her, they fell in love. And he's, he has a book that was called Surprised by Joy, wonderful book. But in the movie uh, Shadowlands, uh, it tells a story about how Joy uh, developed a terminal cancer, and then when she uh, went into remission for a while, they had this, this period, this season of romance. And uh, he was older, and he just had never known this kind of thing at all. And in the movie, a priest um, uh, is talking to C.S., and, and he says, I know how hard you've been praying, and now God is answering your prayer. And Lewis responded, he says, that's not why I pray, Harry. I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray, I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. And then this last sentence, it doesn't change God, it changes me. See, there's that abiding seeking in prayer. God's will comes as we seek. And then from Romans 12, 2, uh, Paul says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. Other translations say complete or perfect for mature there. Now, two things that we need to hear there. First, our minds need to be renewed, okay? Our, our minds, as, as Christians, um, we need to learn uh, different patterns in different ways because m most often in life with an unrenewed mind, when something happens, we run to fear or we run to anger. And he says we need to have our minds Renewed, So it's going to, this new life of living into Christ is going to change our thought patterns. And it's, it's not some difficult thing uh, when we humble ourselves before God. He usually slowly uh, changes and renews our minds. But the second thing here is that it says that his will is good and pleasing and mature or complete. Many people really don't want to know the will of God because they assume that it just can't be good. It's like if, if I re really ever hear from God, he's going to make me go to Africa or some other place and eat bugs. As a missionary is what they think, you know. God's just going to take something away from me is if they, uh, they have this myth about that. And, you know, if we ever really give our lives over to him, then he's going to plunge us into abject poverty. And God says, my will for you is what's good. That's what I'm wanting you to grasp, is that the will for you is good. And living into Christ and trusting God never takes anything away from us, really. We may lose some things, but everything that is lost, everything that's given up is really bad for us anyway. So, in fact, we can say with confidence that if we have given our lives to God and something's been removed, it's for our good 
and that makes it good. So any person who lives into Christ has no reason to not know the Lord's will uh, because God wants us to know and in addition to that we have as I would say the the word and the spirit uh, usually when we're talking about discerning God's will we focus either on one or the other um, in some churches they'll focus on the word everything that you need to know is in the Bible and so if you study the word that you will know and other churches will say no it's the Bible's okay but, but you need more of a spiritual connection with God, and God will reveal things to you by his Holy Spirit. And I want to put these, these two things together here. Obviously, uh, I believe that the word is, is sufficient for all of life. And if we want to know about any decision, any principle, uh, a truth is given into the word someplace. It may not be a specific thing, but it will be always a general principle that, that we can learn that will form and, and give us some boundaries or some directions. But the other thing is, is that the Word was written in the Spirit, and we can't really understand God's Word unless we have the Holy Spirit. And so the two need to go together, the Word and the Spirit. God has given, it says, all who ask His Spirit. Remember when Jesus was uh, in the upper room and he says, really, guys, it's, it's to your advantage that I go away because when I leave, I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to give you the Holy Spirit and you're going to be a whole lot better off once that I'm gone. And we still hear that and we go, wow, that is weird. To, to be with Jesus in the same room, he's saying, it's going to get better. It's, it's getting better than just me. And that's because he was localized. He was in a... a, a you know, a human body where he was just in one place. But the Spirit was going to be poured out on all who would receive it. And John 16, 13, uh, Jesus gives them this promise about the Holy Spirit as it relates to his will. He says, however, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He won't speak on his own, but will say whatever he hears and will proclaim to you what is to come. The spirit of truth guides you into all truth. And that's just one of many places where Jesus says that. And he, he says God's going to give you this onboard guidance system, this kind of you know, built-in GPS system with the Holy Spirit. That's what he promises believers. Now, when we're in the spirit, you know, um, and we read and feed on God's word, then God leads us into his will, into his desire. And, you know, here's, here's the thing. If we rely only on the Bible without the Spirit, then I find that we get legalistic. And we start making lists about things of what's good and bad. If we're just in the Spirit without the Bible, then we go more to intuition. And, and we're led astray sometimes because we don't have those boundaries of, of the other knowledge that's been given to those before us. So these two go together. We need to be in the Spirit and in the Word at the same time. We're spiritual creatures, and, and only uh, by the Spirit can God really communicate with us. It takes not just a, you know, for communication to take place, it takes a speaker, which is the Lord, but it also takes a listener. And we can't really listen unless we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, will not understand what he's saying. And if we are in the Spirit and neglect the Word of God, we, we easily get off track. So I have a theory here, and I've tipped my hat to it a couple times. Many times we really don't want to know what the will of God is. We really don't want to know. Um, people say that they do, but they really don't. Um, they look everywhere else. Uh, talk to everyone but God. They talk about God a lot, but they don't talk to God. Read anything but the Word, and they do about anything but pray. Um, most of the time, I think we're afraid of the Holy Spirit. We're afraid that God will reveal himself to us in such power that we will have to do something, and it will change our lives. And you know, for Christians and non-Christians alike, um, darkness can be very comforting sometimes. 
uh, being in the dark can be what we know and what and the light really um, hurts our eyes it upsets things now if we truly seek uh, Jesus Christ most of the decisions are insignificant I've saved the best for last I think Proverbs 3 5 to 6 which is an Old Testament passage that we could have just used this and left everything else out he says trust in the Lord with all your heart don't rely on your own intelligence know him in all your paths and he will keep your ways straight so long ago way back there in the old covenant trust in the Lord don't don't try to figure everything out for yourself he says if you trust him if you know him with all your heart God will make your your path straight now what that means is that sometimes you're, you're gonna make a decision like changing the tire on Friday afternoon that you know God's gonna work it out for you if you're really trusting in him it becomes insignificant because God is in control but if we're playing some kind of game you know, same, playing some kind of dodgeball game with God where we're, we're trying to, you know, find a little bit out but not a whole lot, there's no way it's going to work out. So simple, so profound. Now here's your take-home question for the day. Do I really want to know God's will? I think we need to ask ourselves that. Do I really want to know God's will? You know, I, am I ready to give over lordship enough to really ask God to reveal his will to me. And the second thing is, if being in the Spirit, if reading his word, are two ways that we, uh, the two ways that we really discern and get to know God, and by in the Spirit I also mean prayer, then am I living in such a way that, it, that I am trying to uh, find God's will? I think it begins with our desire, with our wills. Do we desire to know the Lord? Do we desire ourselves this? And, and we have, uh, you know, it comes down, there's so many difficult things that come up in life. And uh, some of the decisions are, are, are pretty huge sometimes. If we know him, if, if, if we really know God, God will, the things uh, that we mess up, the things where we make mistakes, God, God will, use, unless there's sin, God will use those things in a way that we can't even imagine that he can use. But it all comes down to his will. Let us take a few minutes and sit with this. As deep cries out 